Welcome again to our weekly online Bible class here at Pine Valley Church of Christ. Uh, we are continuing our study of the last words of Jesus to his disciples on that night in the upper room that are contained in John chapter 13 through 17, because they show us what Jesus is really wanting them to remember and focus on, not only while he is still there, but especially after he goes, because that's going to happen very soon. First of all, to his death, but he will return in his resurrection. But then again, not long after that, he will be taken back into heaven to sit at the right hand of God. And he's already been comforting them with uh, the thoughts of the importance of them acting like him, remembering that uh, no servant is greater than their master. And so he has shown them a demonstration of the completeness of his love which was that he would completely humble himself before them and get down like a servant and wash their feet. But his love was going to extend far beyond washing feet. He would truly take that servant approach to the very end as he had throughout his entire life. He then in uh, chapter 14 focused on the importance of their love for one another and keeping his commands. He told him at the end of chapter 13 that this was the new command that they love each other as I have loved you. This is how the world will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. He continues to emphasize that and we'll see it again today in chapter 15. But he adds to it in chapter 14 that uh, connection with obedience. Uh, that we obey God because we love God. We obey Jesus because we love him. And he used himself as an example. And at the conclusion of chapter 14, he mentions, you know, he, everything he is doing, he is doing because he is obeying his father's commands. And he will do that uh, to the cross and to his death. And that is the example he is trying to set for us. As we come to chapter 15 now, and let me get our uh, screen share up. He decides to use an illustration uh, to help them better understand just exactly what he's been talking about. And that is that there, there's this interconnectedness. He's talked about the interconnectedness between he and the father and also between he and his disciples, but when they're connected to him, they're also connected to the Father. Uh, there is a connection that is made by the indwelling of the Spirit that will come after he leaves. There is a picture of if they obey his commands, he and the Father will come and make their home with us, not in heaven in eternity, but while we still live here on earth. And so it is the parable of the uh, vine and the branches at the beginning of chapter 15 that he uses to illustrate more uh, completely to us even more vividly to help us understand all of that connection and the importance they have to each other uh, the idea of people of god being a vine or a vineyard is not uh, something that is new with jesus as often is uh, he uses illustrations that come from the history of Israel and God's dealings with them. And the idea of a vineyard is something uh, that's used several times uh, throughout. It's uh, used in Isaiah 5, uh, Jeremiah 2, Hosea 10, uh, in reference to they were a vine that he planted and they flourished. And yet they have, uh, he says in Jeremiah, why have you gone to being a wild vine, uh, going off and doing your own thing when God had done so much for them. Uh, it's expressed well in Psalm 80, beginning in verse 8. You brought a vine out of Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, and the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its bows to the sea and shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all may 
who pass may pick its grapes, boars from the forest, ravage it, and creatures from the field feed on it. Return to us, O mighty God, and look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. There the sun referring to the people of Israel. But you know, all that relationship is what God has done in planting the vine, caring for the vine, and yet because of their diso disobedience to his commands, uh, they are now floundering and not able to produce the kind of fruit that they had in the past because they've lost the connection to the source of life. He, so he begins here in John chapter 15 with this parable. And we, I encourage you to have your Bible open and read through it uh, just as we go. But it's interesting that he begins at the very beginning in this discussion to refer to himself as the true vine, not just the vine, but I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. The gardener is the one who determines whether something is healthy or not, whether it needs to be pruned, whether it needs to be pulled up, uh, whatever needs to take place to keep the health of the vine itself. But this is uh, one of the seven I am statements made by Jesus throughout the Gospel of John. And he says, I am the true vine. Uh, there's not another one out there. This is the one to which we must be connected. This is in the continuation of that covenant relationship God had with Israel. And yet, because of their disobedience and their lack of faith now in Jesus, uh, they're going to be cut off, and here is the vine to which we must be connected. And in reference to God as the gardener, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, and while every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. He says, it's very simple. Uh, remain in me, you will bear fruit. And he will talk more about how that happens. But if you don't, uh, you can become one of those branches that is cut off uh, by the gardener and thrown in the fire. But the beautiful thing is, uh, even... We stay connected. We stay in that relationship with him. He will prune us. He will do the things that are necessary to help us become even more fruitful in the future if we turn to him and we keep his commands and if we stay attached. And he goes on in verse 5 and following, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. This is the promise. It says, and apart from me, you can do nothing. This must be a part of your faith relationship demonstrated through obedience to his commands uh, that will bring fruit about in your life. And so it you know, begs the question, well, what kind of fruit is he talking about here? And it's often been easy to just draw the uh, conclusion that he's talking about uh, evangelism and the growth of the church. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, he's wanting us to uh, share the gospel with those in the world. And that's part of it. But especially in connection with so much talk about the Holy Spirit here, I think it's much more uh, connected to the fruits of the Spirit, like we see in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, because those are things that make a difference in the world in which we live and allow us to present ourselves in such a way and live such lives that people want to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that can only happen if we remain attached, truly attached to the true vine and not something else. What, how do we stay attached? He says, well, you, you love me, you love each other. And if you love me, you will obey my commands. And when you obey my commands, you will bear fruit, he says. In fact, 
this connects with the instructions about prayer remain in me and my words will remain in you and whatever you wish it will be given to you this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples here's something else that shows the world that we are his disciples that we not only love each other but we're bearing this fruit which is brought through the obedience to his commands and all of it is to the glory of god it is God's plan. It is God's work. It is to God's glory that the son is obeying his commands and that we should do the same and seek this uh, intimate relationship with him that leads to a love that leads to true obedience to his commands. Now, I want to take just a second to make sure that we uh, think about what he has said throughout here and will say several times again, if you obey my commands not obey your interpretations of what i say obey what you infer from things that i say not obey just some things and not others he says my commands uh, those are fairly easy to go through and see what does he actually command not what we think not what we infer nothing along those lines that is what has led to so much uh, division among the people of God throughout the centuries. We've gotten caught up in what Paul refers to as arguments about words and matters of opinion and things, uh, our interpretations that we bring about by our own human wisdom, rather than focusing on the explicit commands of Jesus and of scripture itself. If we stayed focused on that, then it's much easier for us to find that common ground and through that truly stay attached to the true vine. And he says, this is what it's all about, which is summarized in verses nine uh, through 17, but really brought uh, out in verses 12 and following. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends, which he's about to do. And you are my friends if you do what I command. If this is the kind of relationship he is calling us into, because as he concludes, I chose you. You didn't chose, choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. And this specifically is being said to the apostles, but it translates to all followers of Jesus Christ. So he concludes verse 17, which kind of transitions into the next section. This is my command, love each other. And it's going to be important that you love each other because the world is not going to love you. In fact, it is going to hate you. So love each other. Or if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would, have, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Remember the words I said, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they would obey yours as well. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and chosen them, uh, they would... We'll stop there at verse 21, but they don't know the one who sent me. So make sure you're loving each other the way I have loved you. And that is being exemplified in your lives together because it's going to be extremely important uh, to hang on to your faith in a world that is going to hate you. And it's going to hate you because of him. We seek to be like our master. And if they hated him, he's going, they're going to hate us because it is part of uh, the dominion of the prince of this world you know, who he has talked about already and will talk about again. And the world just can't stand to look at something that is so different. And that sort of lead, that leads into the why they hate him so much, which comes out in verses 22 and 27. But first, I want to go back to John chapter 3. 
where after he has had his conversation with Nicodemus about the importance of being born again, being born of water and spirit, that he, uh, John himself makes the comments in verse 16 and following uh, about the gospel of the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But then he goes down further, verse 19. This really relates to what's going on here. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to the light for fear that the deeds will be exposed. But whatever, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he do, has done has been done through God. Uh, we could also read those uh, opening uh, chapter in 1 John, uh, the letter that he writes later in his life. You know, there's, yeah, there's this uh, contrast between walking in the light and walking in the darkness. And those who walk in darkness don't want the light shining on them, so they reject it. In fact, they hate it. And he says the same thing here in verse 22 and following. Uh, if we pick up verse 23, he who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not come, had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles and yet have hated both me and my father. But this is fulfilled what is written in their law. They hated me without a reason, which is a quote from Psalm 25. It's they don't like being shown. You know, remember, it's the religious leaders uh, who were so hypocritical that he, you know, really lashed out at at times. Uh, the general population of people he was uh, gentle with, he was uh, loving, he tried to explain to them the importance of repentance and turning to God because the kingdom of heaven is coming. And he was bringing it into the world, but not in the way they thought. And he, so he demonstrated uh, what it is to walk in the light. And many of them followed, uh, but many more did not uh, because they simply don't like it because it reveals their sin. And when we live in the light and walk in the light, as he describes it in 1 John, uh, it will do the same. And some will see it. Some will, as you know, we obey and we bear fruit, It'll be something that they are drawn to. Uh, others will see it and they will uh, be hateful. They will resent it. And we see it in the world all around us now that, you know, anytime it is expressed, even if it's expressed in a loving way, uh, that some kind of behavior that is uh, accepted by the world is sinful, uh, their immediate comeback is hope. Oh, you, know, you Christians are so intolerant, you are so mean and hateful, claiming that we are doing what they are doing in the way in which they are reacting. And there are people who call themselves followers of Christ who are out there wanting to put their you know, finger in people's faces and tell them how horrible they are and that they're going to help. That was not the way of Jesus. And he, but even if we're just showing it through our words, through our actions, through the fruit that we bear by obedience to God, staying connected with him through faith, uh, the world is not, uh, as a whole, will not respond to it well. Uh, in fact, it says, you know, they've ignored the miracles. Uh, he says in other places, if he had done the miracles in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. And yet, you know, the people of Israel, especially the religious leaders, were not. And if hating me means that they hate the Father again. Here's the interconnectedness that they don't seem to understand. But I do this so that I can testify. And the counselor is going to come, verse 26. And I will send him to the Father in the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And he's going to do it through you. You also must testify for what you have been with me from the beginning. 
And this will come out more in chapter 16, just how this is going to happen. But he's already talked about uh, back in chapter 14 that it is the spirit of truth that is going to help remind them of what he has told them and help them say to other people what needs to be said. This is part of this interconnected relationship that he wants them to come to understanding that they are now a part of in faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, a faith that leads to and comes from a real love for him leads to a love for one another. But no just normal love as the world defines it. A love like Jesus. A love that is sacrificial, willing to become a servant and do whatever others need. And in obedience to his commands, then we allow God, as we stay connected to the vine, which is Jesus, to produce fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faith, kindness, and self-control. There it is. Bear those fruits. The world will take notice. Many will hate you, hate us, because they don't want the light revealing their sin. But it is an important part of who we are and how we carry out and continue to carry out the ministry of Jesus Christ in this world. As my wife likes to say, Jesus is the head. We are the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. We are to be the ones out there uh, taking the good news to them, but also taking to them and serving and doing whatever is necessary uh, to help show the love and grace and mercy of God to his glory. And that is what he is seeking to illustrate to them through this whole time. Uh, next week, we'll get into uh, chapter 16 which he will continue uh, talking about this interconnectedness, their uh, love for one another, but he's going to now expand upon uh, this discussion of the Holy Spirit and his role in this world, uh, though he says, you know, you're not ready to understand it all. When he comes, you will understand it better. Uh, and at that point, you know, as we get into chapter 16, I want us to go back and we're going to sort of piece together all the sections about the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John and see what they're trying to share with us. Uh, because this was important to Jesus, that his people understand that there would be this advocate, this comforter who would come and be with us. So we place our faith in him and are baptized in his name to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us go into the world, obey his commands, and bear fruit. And that is where we will be going next week. I uh, appreciate you joining us for this class. Look forward to our time in chapter 16 next week. So I encourage you to be reading ahead. Between now and then, uh, please stay safe, stay healthy, uh, do everything that is necessary uh, to make sure that we are doing what is loving and servant-hearted in terms of how we deal with the COVID pandemic and making sure that we are putting the safety of others uh, before our own personal wants or rights. So until next week, may God bless you and keep you healthy and safe.